There are a million different things to be anxious or scared about. Most people have one, or even many things they're afraid of. A lot of these fears are often irrational, but a lot of them are deeply rooted in one major concept. Death. You're afraid of heights because falling means an inevitable death. You're afraid of water because you might drown if you jump in. Or maybe a giant octopus drags you underneath the surface. Death is scary at least to me and others who don't find comfort in religion and the belief of an afterlife. It's something that is universal. It transcends social, ideological and geographical differences. Despite this, we know so little about it. Some try endlessly to look for answers whilst others know that there's nothing to be done about their inevitable demise. But if you zoom out and look at different parts of the world, there are wildly different approaches to the question of what death is and how to deal with it. But why is there such a divide? And can we learn something from philosophers around the world to make us better understand this strange concept and make us less scared of death? As humans, we have divided the world into two general parts, the East and the West. In these two parts, we have different religions, cultures and traditions. As Western culture has evolved, so has its view on death. According to Erin Sawatsky, we can define a so-called Western death culture. That is, how we have viewed death throughout history. This culture has fluctuated between two main extremes, necrophobia and necroromanticism. Necrophobia, the extreme fear of dying and dead bodies, is a term used when the overall culture has a stigma around death. While in contrast, necroromanticism refers to the attitudes that embrace or are otherwise intrigued by death. Western culture throughout history have gone back and forth like a pendulum between these main ideologies. Why? While well, different historical events such as war or peaceful times have shifted the pendulum, but the two extreme sides of the spectrum remain largely the same. One of the most concrete examples of this would be cemeteries. Their appearance and roles within communities are highly indicative of a society's death culture. Especially in Western culture, you can see how cemeteries look on the outside, their proximity to communities, if they're open to the public or not, and policies regarding memorials. These are all reflections of our view of death. If we look at necrophobia, for example, or the fear of death, it evolved from Christian beliefs, thinking that when you die, you will be judged by God. As this fear increased, so too did the elaboration of rituals and of individual memorials in attempts to alleviate the dread and isolation now associated with death. Sawatsky noted, Observing Gothic architecture and gates, cemeteries became more and more common, and burial grounds were often attached to churches in an effort to separate the dead from the general community. Elaborate memorials, tombs, and huge mausoleums all became reflections of the dead. This shows that we've always had a hierarchy in society, even in death. The richest people could afford desired graves with fancy mausoleums to accompany them into the afterlife. On the flip side, a romantic view of death has also been prevalent throughout Western society. As far back as in ancient Greece, death was viewed as an intrinsic part of life. Through rituals and memorialization, the dead continue to play important roles in society long after their passing. Cemeteries were a blend of two worlds, the living and the dead, where they were located in close proximity or even interwoven throughout cities and villages. But attitudes like this wouldn't be seen again until the Victorian era which once again romanticized the dead through complex systems of mourning and fanatical memento keeping. Even though Victorian burial sites were moved away from densely populated areas, in response to growing health concerns, they were designed as gardens. They represented communal space and were beautiful, well landscaped with paths and plots balanced against dedicated green space. But how has this evolved into more modern times? Has the pendulum swung in intrigue of death or the opposite? After World War II, death became reduced to its most basic medical terms. Romantic ideals of the mystique of death were stripped away in favor of more modern attitudes. Cremation, for example, provided an alternative to a traditional burial that was viewed as cleaner and more modern. Even the Catholic Church began allowing cremations, with rates rising until the early 2000s. This was just one of many signs that Western society tried to sterilize death with a less religious and more science-based approach. Sawatsky notes that death became medicalized, no longer considered natural but rather a failure. 
As we continued advancing in the realm of science, death resumed its role as a villain and an unnatural event, with many accepting the notion that bodies are no more than organic matter that will rot once dead. But in the eastern world there are completely different ideas of what death means to us, and how people react and react today if their loved ones pass away. The major eastern philosophical ideas is what we generally know as reincarnation, going through life after life after life in an endless series, a process that is represented in the wheel of life, the buddhist wheel of life. In this wheel there are five, or sometimes six, realms of existence through which beings pass through their various lives. We can start with the human world. Next to the human world is the world of the divas, which would be translated into angels. Then there is the world of the animals. This world is sometimes called hell, although this isn't quite correct. It's more of a purgatory, because in this view of life and afterlife there are no permanent states. There is no everlasting heaven, nor is there an everlasting hell. Next to the animal world is the realm of what is called Pritas. They are frustrated spirits, sometimes shown with very large stomachs and very tiny mouths. Enormous appetites, but very small means of satisfying it. The main idea here is that, in the course of our development, the individual goes through life after life. If you do well, you ascend towards the heavens, and if you do ill, you descend to the hells. But you can never stop going anywhere. You may ascend to heaven, but what goes up must eventually come down. You may descend to hell, but what goes down must eventually come up. In Buddhist thought, at least, you will move through these worlds until you become awakened enough to become a Buddha. One who is released from the wheel and does not fall into the sequence of rebirths anymore, but enters the eternal state of nirvana. Of course, Buddhist thought itself does not cover the entire eastern world, but you could generally divide it like this. There is a cosmic view of death, which sees death as a part of the larger cosmos and the cycle of life, where death is not the end but a transition in the soul's ongoing journey as I mentioned before. Then there is the existential view of death. This perspective focuses on the individual's experience and the meaning of death and life, thinking deeply and confronting one's mortality and the nature of existence. The familial view of death focuses on social and relational aspects of death, where societies worship their ancestors, remembering them and performing rituals to honor and support them in their afterlife journey. Then finally, the natural view of death which sees death as a natural process, part of the natural order and the cycle of life and death. Hinduism, for example, is mostly focused on the cosmic view of death, with some aspects of familial and existential views, overlapping a lot with Buddhism. But Buddhism incorporates existential views in a lot of its philosophical thought. Cosmic views through the concept of nirvana and the wheel of life, and they also worship their ancestors, which follows the familial view. Chinese religions really emphasize the familial aspect, influenced by Confucianism's focus on worshipping one's ancestors. As modern society, both Eastern and Western have moved towards a secular approach to life. Eastern societies seem to have carried with them the philosophies that have helped them cope with death. But why are we, and by we I mean myself, a person from the Western Hemisphere inclined to be scared of death? Well, I would argue that we haven't really found a replacement yet to the safety blanket of religion. Western society, from World War II and onwards, have swung further and further towards necrophobia. Now some people find comfort in this. They prefer not to think about death, and when it happens, deal with it swiftly and cleanly with cremation. But for a lot of people, I think the inevitability and mystery of death is quite a burden to handle. Unlike other species, humans can reflect on death. The response I've seen over and over again, no matter where you live, to deal with the mystery and fear humans associate with death is to create systems of religious meaning that give purpose to life in the face of death. But it's hard, if not impossible, to force yourself to believe in something you don't believe in. So try to find some meaning or answers around death that aren't necessarily religious, and if you don't want to go down this route, just try to distract yourself.